Well, welcome to our first Fridays of the Forester this year, 2023, uh, Maple Syrup Back to Basics. And thank you for joining us today. Our first presenter is uh, Stu Peterson. And uh, while our web webinar host is myself, Gary Wyatt, Extension Educator with the University of Minnesota Extension down in Mankato Regional Office and uh, Lauren Beckus from uh, our regional office in, uh, in Andover. So we're, uh, we're gonna be hosting the, the webinar today with questions and answers and so forth and Stu. And our main speaker on today's topic of maple syrup back to basics is Stu Peterson and he's a champion um, maple syrup producer out of uh, uh, well, Western Minnesota actually, Camp Akula Pure Maple Syrup LLC. So we're really happy to, to uh, have Stu here I'll talk about his maple syrup operation and actually the basics. So uh, he's really included a lot of uh, good information for beginners to experts. So we're really pleased uh, to have him on today. Real quickly about the details of this webinar. It's a Zoom webinar, so uh, nobody's allowed to, to uh, see each other and uh, you're all muted, but we want you to ask questions in the Q&A. And then uh, certainly um, our we want to go till 10 o'clock. We can go over uh, if we have lots of questions, that's fine. Uh, we will be re recording this and the recordings will be on our zlink.z.umn.edu slash Fridays. And you can look up those at any time. And we even have last year's recordings as well. So Stu, I'm going to stop sharing here and I'll let you share your screen. Well, thank you, Gary. Um, I'm told there are as many as 200 registrants for this session, or at least could be, that's how many have registered for the series um, of Fridays with a fourth. Um, as I understand it, you all can see me and I can't see you. Um, and uh, <laughs> reminds me of a line from a country song that I've never done anything like this before. Um, but we'll do our best. It's going to be fun. Um, the approach I want to use is I want to go through my prepared remarks uh, fairly quickly and hopefully allow a fair amount of time at the end for questions or comments or if I say something that you might not agree with, uh, that's happy to, to discuss it. Um, but I really want to put emphasis on on going through a lot of what I consider the back to the basics issues that, that I think need to be, should be considered, and uh, then come back for questions and discussion afterwards. So that's the approach we hope to take. Uh, so write down any topics you want to have, and, and uh, I think it's, it's under that Q&A bar in the, uh, in the program here. So, by way of introduction, uh, this will be our 24th season producing maple syrup. I tapped my first tree in 2000. We tapped 50 trees. Uh, in 2003, that would be our fourth season. Uh, we expanded and to what we considered a commercial operation. Um, we started selling to the public. We were licensed by the MDA. We became certified organic by Minnesota Crop Improvement. And today we're running about 1,300 taps on gravity lines. It's not real fancy. We're pretty simple. Uh, but it's what uh, the two of us can handle here at home. Um, our market is selling to local stores and restaurants. And uh, I've been quite active in the Minnesota Maple Syrup Producers Association and uh, both of the international maple organizations. So. Um, I wish I could get this. Anyway, uh, regardless of the number of taps, whether you're doing three taps in the backyard or 100 taps between you and your neighbors or, or your own property, or if you're doing 500 or 5,000 taps, we're all doing the same thing. Uh, we're just all doing it a little differently. And this is kind of what I want to go through today. Tapping, collecting sap, um, boiling and concentrating, 
finishing it to a final product and then filtering and, and getting it bottled. Uh -oh. There we go. Uh, maple syrup is produced um, really in the area on this map. It's, it's the area that surrounds the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence Seaway. Th this is where virtually all of the world's production on a commercial basis of maple syrup takes place. Uh, the Great Lakes and up the St. Lawrence Seaway. So we've got Minnesota way out on, on the western edge. And that's why in Minnesota, we say we're syruping on the edge. And off the edge of the map is Nova Scotia. And literally, this is, this is where all commercial maple syrup, virtually all of it is produced. And Quebec is, is the big gorilla. They produce two thirds of the world's maple syrup. Canada is overall is about 80% and the United States is about 20% of total world production. So more basics, um, nothing is added to sap to make pure maple syrup. Only water is evaporated away and the sediments are filtered out. And once we're at the correct density, pure maple syrup is filtered and hot packed, bottled, and it'll, it'll give it a very long shelf life if we've got the right package going into, or the, the right concentration going into a, a hot packed, well sealed bottle. Uh, this picture on the lower left is our product as it's ready to go to market, all bottled and labeled. The one on the lower right is just an example of shelf life. Um, this picture was taken very recently, but it's a bottle, a small favor, a wedding favor that we bottled in 2003 for my daughter's wedding. And it's as, it's as pretty as it was in 2003. So that's what, 20 years ago. More basic, why does sap run? Sap runs in response to pressure differential, internal within the tree and external as compared to the barometric pressure, atmospheric pressure. Um, we all say and we all know that sap is supposed to run on warm sunny days that follow cold freezing nights. And that's pretty well true, but I think an aspect of sap runs that probably doesn't get enough attention um, is the impact of atmospheric pressure. The stronger sap runs, the, the stronger sap runs when the pressure is falling and we'll have weaker sap runs when the pressure, atmospheric pressure is rising. Because what we're talking about is the differential of pressure within the tree and out in the, in the atmosphere. We'll get back to that in a little bit, but it's, uh, I, I, can, I can remember a 35 degree day that followed probably a 32 degree night. And we had a big snowstorm coming in and it was a low pressure. And it was not the kind of weather that I had expected sap to run. And by afternoon, all of our collection um, containers were full or overflowing and it was we weren't ready for it, but that was because of atmospheric pressure. That wasn't a hot sunny day, a warm sunny day after a freezing night. So it's more than just freezing and thawing. Okay, more basics. A healthy maple tree can be retapped year after year, although a new tap hole must be drilled each season. And I think it's very important to remember that every tap hole is a wound into that tree. They heal up and they do just fine, but they are wounds. Um, absolute best practices would be one trap, one one tap per tree per year. Uh, in the old days, they used to say a lot more than that was acceptable. Uh, the research now basically says, and a lot of this comes from out east, where they do a lot of maple research, that two taps are acceptable for very large healthy maple trees with a diameter about shoulder high of over 20 inches. But they're basically saying that, that two taps are the max um, for optimum uh, forest health. This next one is what is not recommended. So ask yourself, how many holes in the tree are too many? 
Well, I don't know how many or too many are, but this is too many. And um, the question is, where will this producer find good sapwood next year or the year after? Uh, you can girdle a tree if you go around the same circle year after year after year with too many taps. And uh, uh, eventually the, the tree just will not be able to conduct and, and it'll wither and die. Getting started in maple, uh, you need maple trees, access to trees. You need tapping supplies. You need a collection system. You need an evaporator of some kind and a fuel supply. And you need to figure out how you're going to finish and filter and bottle your syrup. As for trees in Minnesota, I think I think the species we're tapping in Minnesota include the sugar maples, black maples, the red maples, the silvers, and the box elder. The lowly box elder, also known as the Manitoba maple. Uh, those are, I think, all the species that we're really tapping in Minnesota as, as maple uh, producers. We've got some producers in the state that also are tapping some birch and walnut trees. And you can make you can make nice syrup out of those. It's it's different flavored, but uh, that's basically what we're tapping in Minnesota. The question for producers, if they're starting out or thinking about expanding, is how many trees are you going to tap? How many taps out there? How much sap will that collect? And how many spouts are you going to need or spiles? Uh, here's examples of spiles that are in use today. I've got a slide that I didn't use of, of antique spiles. They're, they're really fun what they used to use. Um, uh, spouts or taps come in several sizes. Seven sixteenths was a standard when I got started 25 years ago, 24. Um, we used a seven sixteenths spout for the first three or four years. And then we went to what was called a health spout, a 5 sixteenths diameter hole into the tree. Uh, there is a 7 six, a 17 sixty-fourths size on the market, and they're also 3 sixteenths, which is relatively new. All new, um, a whole new concept of, of gravity tubing is, is followed the development of 3 sixteenths research. Um, on that left slide, uh, you've got uh, various examples. This is for a bucket. Uh, this obviously, you're going to need some tubing to connect to this one. Um, third one down is for hanging a bucket or perhaps even a, a bag system. And the bottom two, again, are uh, would connect to tubing with the, the little barbed um, spot at the bottom. Second picture is just a, a, a bucket hanging type spiral in a tree. Third picture is three different styles of stainless steel, which is sort of the, the premier tap. Um, those aren't throwaway, they last forever. Um, and they come made for hooks, or made for buckets with hooks, without a hook, uh, which perhaps is, is a tubing connection. And then the one on the, the bottom, I think, is set up for a bag collection system. So depending on what kind of collection system you're going to have, you may need to use tubing. You may want to hang a bucket. Um, but these, are, these really have to match up with whatever collection system you're using. The one on the far right is what we use. Uh, we're using uh, essentially disposable taps, um, the plastic um with tubing down to our gravity lines okay drills and bits the old style brace and bit was sort of the standard for the industry for a long time um most producers are now using battery drills and special tapping bits um and i emphasize that the the special tapping bits that you can get from a maple supplier are just 
far, far, far better than what you can get at the hardware store or worse yet, out of your toolbox. Uh, they make a cleaner hole, uh, they clean out the, the debris, and they don't suck in the way some wood bits do. So it just makes a better hole, and I would recommend them. Bits should be kept sanitary and not used for other purposes. Um, your hole depth um, doesn't need to be any deeper than two inches, and that includes uh, the bark. And for at least particularly for gravity systems, buckets and, and gravity tubing systems, upward at a slight angle into the tree. Um, and I think that's what I had to say about drills and bits. Um, for the first three or four years, I was a real traditionalist. I wanted to use the brace and bit. Uh, it's really hard to get a nice round concentric hole when you're you're drilling with a brace and bit. It's much easier to get a good clean hole with a with a well charged electric drill. Here's some examples of collection containers. Upper left is uh, what looks to be either a milk jug or a water jug with a tubing on a plastic spout. Uh, the second is an example of a of a bag and a uh, an old style bucket hung, hanging on the tree. Third one over is a gravity tubing system flowing into a large, essentially a large bucket, a large con collection container. That's what we use. Uh, that's that's from our farm. Upper right, uh, some good sized glass containers. Um, lots of capacity in those. Um, and once again, a plastic spile and tubing into the collection jug. Lower left is another sap bag. Um, it's also marked for quartz. So this particular bag has about, almost has a gallon in it. That's about eight pounds. It's sap is essentially the same weight as water, eight pounds to a gallon. Um, so you're putting a little weight uh, when you got a full bag. Uh, next picture is from our sugar bush in the early years. We used almost four gallon, we, we call them bakery buckets. Uh, we got all of them, all of our buckets from, from a couple of bakeries. Their ingredients came in it and they worked out well. We tried hanging them on the tree the first couple of years, but at three or four gallons when they got full, it was hard on the buckets and it was hard on the spiles. And we ended up going to uh, reducing the, the size of the spile and, and, and putting the buckets on the ground. Um, next one over is for me, and I think for a lot of producers, sort of the ideal sap storage container. It's, a, it's an old bulk milk tank. They're double walled with insulation. So if you put cold sap in there, it will stay quite cold for quite a while. Um, it'll preserve the coolness and, and keep it from, from getting too warm, even if you have to park it outside. Lower right is there's a lot of poly tanks being used for sap collection and sap storage. Just examples of what's out there. Here's some more examples. Uh, another poly tank uh, with uh, Somebody dumping a bucket up over their shoulders. That works really good for the first 25 buckets. It gets, it gets kind of hard on the shoulders if you do that for four hours in the afternoon. Um, second one over is very similar, just a different sized or shaped poly tank. Uh, this fell on the right, he never lifts the bucket. This is a very high end vacuum tubing system that basically transports sap from the tree um, through the lines, to the sugar house, and uh, a pretty slick, efficient system. They've got their own maintenance issues to deal with, but you can move a lot of sap, and big operations really need that kind of a setup. Um, lower left is a, another poly tank on the back of a, a Polaris. This is actually our setup. We run a little Honda pump, and the hose goes down into our collection bin. And 
pump the sap up into the tank. When the tank is full, close to 100 gallons or even a little more, we run that back to the sugar house and unload it and go back for more. Uh, this is just one of my favorites. Been on a lot of tours and visited a lot of a lot of operations over the years. This is probably my most favorite sap collection setup. This fella had a really neat stainless steel tank on a on a boat trailer with nice wide tires to get through the mud. Uh, a battery, 12 volt battery up front that ran a pump in the back, and they would dump buckets at about knee high so they weren't lifting it over their head and when this tank was full enough they would pump up into the into the the bigger tank and they could just go through the woods and take a lot of the effort out of dumping buckets too high over their over their shoulders but i just thought this was it was stainless steel it was clean it was all food grade and i was impressed Sap collection tips. Uh, you want to have enough capacity to be ready for the big sap run, which is going to be as much as two gallons of sap per day. And if you don't get it cooked, you're going to have more sap the next day. And so you need you need two or three gallons of sap storage capacity, in my opinion, to be ready for the big runs. Um, you can expect five to 10 gallons of sap per tap over the season. Um, last year was an excellent year for us and we got about nine gallons on our system over the course of the year. The folks on gravity do probably twice that in the amount of, of sap per tap. So this is sort of a guideline for uh, those of us on gravity. Um, another tip, Collect the sap as it runs, get it out of the sun, and don't let your buckets run over. You want to boil your fresh, clear sap as soon after collection as possible. Uh, keep it cool, and if you can, avoid storing it for days. And if you have to store it for a few days, get it out of the sun. Um, sun is your enemy when it comes to preserving sap. The longer sap sits, more microorganisms form and sap spoils just like milk in just a few days if it's if it's warm and sunny another word of caution um, be really really careful when you're using or looking around for or someone's going to give you or you're going to purchase used collection and storage tanks um, in plastic or poly Everybody knows that a pickle bucket, like we used to be able to get from McDonald's, is a food grade bucket. But if you store sap in a food grade pickle bucket, you're going to end up with pickle flavored sap. And that's going to end up as an off flavor in your finished syrup. Um, there's an awful lot of these, um, I think they call them IBC totes on the market. They make terrific storage for sap. They clean out pretty well. Uh, they're a nice size. I think most of them are 275 gallons. But a lot of these are start out as food grade plastic when they're new. But if they're used for agricultural chemicals or if they're used for um, industrial plant supplies, you're going to have a heck of a time getting these to ever be back up to food grade in terms of you know, something that's going to impart um, bad flavor into your finished product. So just saying, be careful when you buy used polys. Um, these two, actually, these were ours. They came out of a dairy plant. They were yogurt supplies and they worked well for us. Um, so I'm not saying don't use them. I'm just saying research where they come from and what they were previously used for. Types of evaporating systems. The very small producers can have a lot of fun and, and get away just fine using a turkey boiler pot or a kettle. Um, it gets pretty old when you have a lot of sap to cook that way, but for a very tiny little backyard operation, there's nothing wrong with that. We're seeing a lot of restaurant um, warming pans. 
uh, buffet pans over barrel stoves as kind of a popular small producer uh, evaporator. Lots of flat pans over cinder block setups. Um, and then eventually you move into the commercial continuous flow systems and they can be simple and they can be exceedingly complex and perhaps a little overwhelming to look at and understand, but we're all doing the same thing. We're boiling water out of sap and reducing it down to syrup. Um, the larger the pan surface that is exposed to the heat, the more, the, the faster you're going to boil that sap away. So what you want is a lot of surface area and uh, a lot of heat underneath it. Here's some examples of uh, cooking setups for the small producer. Uh, as I said, these are stock pots on a stove. I'd be careful if you're going to do that in your own kitchen. You're going to put a lot of steam in the air. Second one is, is another really fun backyard setup. Uh, uh, basically a buffet warming pan over a, uh, an LP cooker. Probably a, a, a turkey boiler setup with a probably a better pan than a than a turkey pot on top of it. Number three is a, looks to me to be a, a small commercial pan over a hand built cinder block setup. Uh, another fun setup for a small producer. I like the one on the upper right, a barrel stove with a big flat pan on it with a rack to pull the uh, the pan off the fire when you get it cooked down. Lower left is uh, a another barrel stove with with two separate stoves, uh, two separate um, pans on it. And I presume what we're doing is, is moving the more concentrated sap from one pan to the other and adding fresh sap to the first one until it's all cooked out. Uh, the second from the left on the bottom, my guess is as a four burner propane setup, this thing really can boil sap. Uh, it's going to give it a nice, steady, even heat. And, uh, it's a nice big flat pan. So a lot of surface and a lot of heat. Next one over is a small commercial arch wood fired. Uh, it's certainly a continuous flow. Sap is entering in this corner and running through the channels, and that river of sap comes out as probably close to finished syrup, but not finished at the at the far end of the process. Uh, the lower right is a, a I think that was like a three by five flat pan on cinder blocks. That's the one I cooked on for the first three years. Uh, that was it was. It was a hoot. Uh, we had a good time, and a neighbor and I cooked on on his equipment. And um, that cooker is now in Maplewood State Park uh, as a part of their demonstration program. Okay, here's examples of three commercial continuous flow evaporators. One on the left is a small two by six, which means it's two feet wide and six feet long in terms of its. Um, uh, surface area exposed to the fire. This one is pretty pretty nice. It's got a fan set up. It's wood fired. Uh, the hot gases go under the flue pan in the back and out the back. It's got um, two steam hoods and there is no steam getting into the sugar house. It really just all goes right up the, um, the steam hoods. Second one over is basically the big brother to, to the first one. This is a two and a half by eight foot. It's got three pans, a, a sap pan in the back and two front pans. And once again, the, the river of sap just comes in as weak sap and works its way through the channels and through the various pans and is drawn off at the very end as, as almost syrup. This is actually my evaporator. I've had it for 20 seasons now. It's been really good to me. It's wood fired. And the one on the right is awesome. Uh, <laughs> I believe this one is gas fired. It could be oil. I don't remember, but it is it is a really nice large commercial evaporator uh, with all the bells and whistles. 
and I believe I took this picture down at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. Uh, but they had just installed it, and it was it was a beauty. Okay, now we got to talk about finishing because most of us who are boiling on wood don't finish our syrup very well until we transfer it over to a gas uh, finishing pan of some kind. Uh, your objective is to get your concentrated sap to 66 to 67.9 percent or bricks, as, as it's called, the 66 bricks, 67.9. Um, that's a very narrow range, but that is the range of legal maple syrup. If you're done, if you're at 64 bricks, you have not made syrup. And if you have gone to 68 or 69 bricks, um, you're also not, you're beyond making syrup. And you're probably going to get uh, sugar crystals in the bottom of that over-concentrated syrup. So the syrup boiling point is 7.1 degrees higher than the boiling point of distilled water. And the dilemma is, is the boiling point of water at your location 212 degrees or something else? Um, pure water boils at 212 only when the barometric pressure is 29.92 inches of mercury also known as sea level. So 212 plus 7.1 or 219.1 is not finished syrup in Minnesota. Atmospheric pressure changes by location, elevation, and from hour to hour, which means you're really chasing uh, a moving target if you're trying to do, if you're trying to finish your syrup using only a thermometer. And it's really, really difficult to do that. It, to, and, and, and hit that narrow band of, of ideal concentration for maple syrup. Experienced sugar makers use a combination of all these instruments, a thermometer, a hydrometer, and a refractometer. Lots of pans are set up with a thermometer, but they sensor threading right into the pan, upper left-hand one. Uh, on the upper right-hand corner is a hydrometer that floats in the liquid, the, the concentrated sap for testing, and you can read it on the scale on the hydrometer. And the lower one is a refractometer, a handheld uh, prism instrument. And all three of those in combination can really take the guesswork out of, of um, making the strip you're trying to target, at, as I say, 66 to 67.9 bricks. So here's how to measure with a hydrometer. You fill a hydrometer cup, in this case, with hot syrup off the evaporator. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little red line right floating with the, at the top of the liquid. And that's telling this producer that their syrup is finished and it's ready for filtering and, and bottling. On the far right is just another example. This is another hydrometer but it's calibrated for sap. And so this is a sample of 4% sugar in the raw sap. And this actually came off of, uh, uh, out of one of our storage tanks a couple of years ago when we had some really high syrup content for a few days. Okay, using a refractometer. Uh, the advantage to these are they really use a small amount, just a couple drops of syrup. You don't need a whole cup. There are versions of this that will test both sap and calibrated for syrup or sap. Uh, the new models are working, will work with any temperature. They've got what they call an automatic temperature compensation. So it, uh, it'll adjust. These really aren't all that expensive considering what they help you do, 80 to $90. I think I forgot to mention that the hydrometer, a cup and a hydrometer will cost about $50 together. So you can get started with accurate um, concentration without investing a total arm and leg. Uh, on the right is a digital refractometer. Uh, these get a little more expensive, uh, but they're also extremely accurate and uh, and 
um, will serve you well if you want to make that kind of investment. Okay, now we move on. We finished our syrup. We've got it at the concentration that we want. Um, and now we talk about filtering. And technically what we're filtering out is calcium and magnesium salts of malic acid, also known as nitre or sugar sand. And looking at that filter on the far right, that's what it looks like. Um, you end up with suspended solids, which equals cloudy syrup. And a lot of it will settle to the bottom of a jar, but not all of it. So if you're a very small producer and you don't want to go to the bother of, the bother of filtering, um, you don't have to. You can let it settle on the shelf and, and you'll have some pretty nice syrup at the top of your, your mason jar. But it does offer a, a gritty texture if you get into the, the gunk at the bottom and it, it can affect flavor. Um, nitre or sugar sand forms right at the very end of the process as sap concentrates or closely gets very close to becoming syrup. Um, so you'll find it on a continuous flow evaporator. You'll find it right at the draw off part of your, of your operation, the front pan. Um, it also flakes and accumulates on a pan. And when it starts to flake in a pan, um, it'll plug up your valves. And so maintenance in season is always required to clean both the pans in addition to filtering your syrup. Here's some examples of syrup filters. A lot of small producers are using just a coffee filter over, over a jar. That's okay. Uh, you'll get a lot of it out, but you'll not get good clean. You probably won't get good, clean, clear syrup. Um, with that method. I've never done it that way, so I can't totally speak to it, but I've, I've seen examples. Lots and lots of small producers are using the cloth cone and a polyester pre-filter, or more than likely several pre-filters. Uh, the lower left um, is a filter cone, on uh, most likely a, a, a handmade holder and a pot underneath and hot syrup is poured through it and clear syrup is coming out. As the inner filters, the pre-filters fill up with gunk, um, they can be switched out. And at the end of, of every bottling session, you've got to clean those filters and, and have it ready for the next batch. Uh, this is really just a, a commercial version of, of how you can use a, a cone filter setup. Uh, one of the problems with this is that as the, syrup, as the syrup cools, it gets harder and harder to drain through a filter as it's uh, accumulating uh, the stuff that it's filtering out. So that can be a little frustrating. Uh, I think this kind of setup might keep the syrup warmer longer. Uh, second or third from the right, um, these are some pretty slick commercial versions of, of a gravity filter, only they're enhanced with a vacuum that's created by, by hooking onto essentially a small um, shop back in reverse. And it'll, hot syrup is pulled in, poured in the top, it goes through um, the filter. That's right at this level here. The bottom is sealed, um, so you can create a vacuum underneath, and it basically just will pull the hot syrup through and, and filter it. And it's uh, it's a little more efficient and a little more uh, and a little faster than a true gravity system. Um, the far right is a very small filter press. Uh, this is actually the one we use. It's um, it it. The pump takes syrup out of our finishing pan directly and it pumps it through filter paper inside uh, various filter plates and out comes filtered syrup, which goes right up into our bottling pan. Lots of variations on this seam, but um, it takes it takes the guesswork out of filtering and 
it really will produce crystal clear um, finished maple syrup. Now we get to bottling. Uh, after filtering, syrup should be bottled at a temperature of between 180 and 200 degrees. If it's any, if it's bottled at a lower temperature than 180, you're more than likely going to have a much higher incidence of, of mold forming on your product. And if your bottling pan heat is over 200, you're going to form, you have a high chance, high probability of forming more nitre after you just filtered it all out and you have clean syrup to start with. So you want to be in that band. Um, hot packing at that temperature range reduces the contamination from microbes and that causes fungus growth or, or mold in your bottles. Um, when you're a hot bottle, uh, the recommend basically, I think, is you should be tipping your hot syrup in your closed sealed container over for five to ten minutes to let it let the Headspace on top of the bottle will get hot and sterilized. Um, make sure you've got a good seal and it's a way of checking for cap leaks. So in these pictures, a very basic bottling setup uh, in a coffee pot. I hope it's a dedicated coffee pot and not imparting off flavors from that morning's coffee. Um, but this will work for a small producer. It's hard. I think it's probably hard to, to know for sure what temperature uh, you're bottling at. But once again, for the for the very small home producer, for their own consumption, there's probably nothing wrong with, with that approach. This is it's maybe the next step up, a sealed pot, which will go over heat. Um, and you bottle right off of that. Once again, you got to be really careful of controlling the heat. If it's on a burner, you can get hot spots. This is a small, the far right is a small commercial bottling pan. Uh, you can see it has a thermometer on it to tell you what the temperature of your syrup is. You can control the heat with, uh, with the LP setup. And you've got an adjustable shelf uh, for whatever size container you're filling. So, and they get from here on up, there are some very, very fancy um, bottling setups that will bottle several bottles at a time. And um, there's, there's no end to the sophistication if you want to spend the money. So I guess this is sort of in summary. To produce quality maple syrup, you need clean food-grade equipment. You need to be tapping healthy maple trees. You need to boil fresh, clear sap as soon as possible after collection. Uh, you want to achieve bricks of 66.0 to 67.9. I target 66 and a half. Um, you want to filter out the sediment for a clear final product. And you want to be sure you're hot packing at 170 or 180 to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And like I said in the beginning, Sugar makers are all doing the same thing. They just do it a little differently. So I think with that, that covers the stuff I wanted to get through. I hope I've left enough time for whatever Q&A is out there. And uh, Gary, you'll have to tell me what to do next with my controls here. Yes. Uh, can you hear me, Stu? I can. Yes. Uh, let's leave your slides up uh, for now. You may have to go back for some of the questions and uh and uh, chat that we have the, in both Q and A and also chat. Uh, I'm going to have Lauren read the questions in the Q and A, and then I'm going to follow in the chat and try and get some of those questions that people have submitted. Um, so I'll start out with the first one in chat real quickly. Uh, this is a recording, so uh, uh, you can look back on this recording uh, at, actually uh, on Z Link Z.umn.edu. Uh, slash Fridays, and I'll I'll mention that at the end uh, too in our ending slides. Uh, first question, um, let's see. I never knew about the atmospheric pressure affects sap runs. Uh, that's interesting. That's from Sonia, and that's not maybe a question, but just a thing. Uh, does it matter how high off the ground the tap hole is drilled? Let's see. When in an additional question here with that same person, Christina. 
uh, when the tree heals the tap wound, does that essentially cut off that pillar of sapwood, i.e. does sap only travel vertically? So there are kind of two, three questions maybe there, Stu. Okay. Um, I think the first one was how high on a tree? Yes. Or what is the proper height for a, a tap? Yes. Uh, I think I think ideally, if you were at two feet above the ground, that would be maybe ideal. Um, but you've got pressure within that entire tree trunk. And I have I have a gravity tubing system. And what I want is pitch or slope on my lines so that the sap will travel through the lines. And I'll be perfectly honest, we're tapping sometimes six or eight feet off the ground. And um, when you're out there in snowshoes, you can tap high. And when you come back to pull taps, you need a ladder to reach them. Um, okay. But I, I think there probably is an ideal height if <laughs> according to the textbook, but nothing is like the textbook when you get out in your in your own sugar bush. Um, so long story short, I would say we tap at many times uh, between two and <laughs> between two feet and and ten feet on the tree trunk. Uh, what you're looking for is healthy sapwood. That's the most important thing. Um, the other question had to do with um, help me, Gary. Uh, I can read it again. Yeah. So when the tree heals, the tap wound oh. does does that essentially cut off the pillar of sapwood? I.e., does sap only travel vertically? Um, yeah, the the textbooks, the research recommends that the new tap wall, I think, be at least two inches to four inches left or right of the old sap hole and four to six inches higher or lower. And they show in, in the books and the diagrams that a nice spiral rotation year after year around the tree is the healthiest pattern. Um, and what is happening is when you drill a hole and it heals up, it forms non-conductive wood, uh, basically in a in a vertical up and down around the tap hole. So you really need to get away from last year's or the year before's um, non-conductive wood. Um, and depending on tree growth and conditions, it takes it takes several years, a lot of years in some cases, for new sapwood to form over uh, an old hole to the point where you can tap and, and get uh, good good sap out of fresh sapwood that's grown over. Uh, there's there's some neat cross cuts of maple trees that that show an old an old hole that's been grown over with fresh sapwood. So eventually you can get fresh sapwood, but year after year you want to be moving that that new hole ideally in a spiral around the tree. Okay, thank you, Stu. Lauren, do you have a Q&A question? Yep, um, first one is, do Norway maples produce a tasty sap? I couldn't tell you. Uh, <laughs> my guess, I, I'm not even totally familiar with, with the Norway because we've got all sugar maples in our woods and a, and a few uh, box elders. Um, but I think what I know about the Norways is they have a relatively low sugar content and it takes a lot of sap to produce a given quantity of uh, a, a quart or a gallon or whatever of syrup. And, and I think there is some, I know there is some slight variation of flavor of syrup among the species, but I'm not, I don't have any experience with the Norway. So someone else has an answer to that one, shoot it in. Sure. You know, mentioned in the chat, if you've got a uh, Norway maple, you've been tapping in the flavor. So here's a, a message from Grand Ray. Mike Hoffer uh, from Grand Ray communicated in the past with you. Uh, I have a remote sugar bush of 500 plus taps at 3 16th to a collection tank and wonder if or what you're using for a sap transfer pump. Uh, is it rated at or for potable water, NSF certified, et cetera? We are, yep, 
Um, somewhere here, I had a picture of it. Mm -hmm. um, we are using a little, the smallest Honda pump on the market. Uh, I think uh, smallest gas fired pump um, on the back of our ATV. Uh, this might be it. Lower left, uh, I mean, lower right picture uh, pumping into the poly tank. Um, I cannot tell you for sure whether that is NSF or not. It, it's never been used for anything except maple sap and water. I can tell you that. Um, and uh, it's, it, it has served us well. Um, so that... Okay, thank you. That's the best I can tell you on that one. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm quite sure it is. We, we're using all um, PVC tubing, and um, and hoses, and so to the to the maximum extent we can, we're using all food grade when we're pumping that sap. Okay, Lauren, next question. Um, does the flavor vary from area to area, central to east coast? The flavor? Yep, the question? flavor. Yeah. Um, well, I'd say flavor varies. <laughs> flavor can vary from tree to tree on a given farm. Um, flavor can vary from week to week in the season. Um, and yes, there is some variation, I think, within species, um, um, but it, it's, it, it's, you've got to pretty much have two samples side by side and taste them both and say, yes, this has got a slightly different flavor. And it may be because it's out on the East Coast and uh, the trees they're tapping out there versus our sugar maples. Um, I contend that we have climate and soil in our favor and our sugar maples and some of the trees that they're tapping out east on those mountainsides in Vermont don't have a lot of soil. Um, their typical sugar content is lower by quite a bit. Um, there's a lot of producers out east that are happy if they're at 1.8 and 1.9% sugar. And I get grumpy when we get down close to three. So a lot of a lot of variation and, and it, it can all be good syrup i'm not saying that just because there's differences it's poor quality syrup but um there is there is subtle variation in syrup for lots of reasons part of which is tree species and part of which is geography i think okay thank you uh mike i'm gonna skip a few of your questions i think he, uh Stu answered some of those uh, Deborah asks, uh, if you're just making it at home for fun, is it safe to use or eat, let's say, use, eat un, unfinished syrup or not get the Brinks percentage exactly right? Let's see. I think I read uh, that right. No, I would say for home consumption, if you're not going to give it away to neighbors and, and relatives and... <laughs> or whatever, maybe you do want to give it to your relatives, but if, if, if you let the, the niter and the, and the, um, the solids settle to the bottom and use the syrup on top, um, I don't see that as a huge issue. If you don't quite get it finished to the 66 bricks, um, I would say you probably want to refrigerate it from the time you make it. Um, the risk is you're going to get mold on top mm. and you really don't want to be eating mold, moldy food. Um, and right. if, if you miss the bricks too high and you go over, um, the, the 60, um, seven, nine, um, you're going to get, you're going to get sugar crystals forming at the bottom. And that's pretty common if you store syrup for a long time in your refrigerator, uh, an open bottle, you probably get enough evaporation over time and sugar crystals will form. Unlike honey, it's really, really hard to warm that up and get it out. Um, you pretty much have to chip the the sugar candy off the bottom of, of a container if you can. 
Okay. Thank, thank you, Stu. I know we're reaching the point of 10 o'clock, but we're continuing. We're going to record and we're going to try and answer all the questions with Lauren and I and Stu. And so if you, can, you want to stay on, that's fine. And if you have to leave, that's fine. Uh, we will have the recordings recorded on uh, the Z-Link, z.umn.edu slash Fridays. But uh, we're going to continue on to record the questions that uh, are asked here uh, by the good folks, uh, about uh, 84 folks attended today's uh, program. Uh, Lauren, do you have a question there? Yep. Um, why do they say that plastic taps should be thrown away, but steel don't have to be? Can't they be sanitized in the same way? Good question. Um, and I don't like throwing away taps and I don't like sending them to the landfill. We use the plastic taps um, and we and we do not rotate out all our taps every year. Um, I go through and I look at the tap and in the off season, um, we leave our lines out and you can get insects uh, that'll crawl in a tap if, if they have a chance, if, they, if, they, if they're not capped. Um, if you're just using a tap and pulling it from the tree and trying to sterilize it, it's they don't last so well in boiled water. If you take a stainless steel tap and you can clean those and sterilize them and start fresh, um, that is the ideal. Uh, there's some beautiful stainless steel taps out there that uh, are available. They're not cheap, but they do last virtually forever. Uh, so all things being equal, I would prefer to use the stainless steel uh, for reasons of practicality, it just doesn't work for us to pull 1,300 taps and cut them off the lines and take them in and, and sterilize them. So I'm guilty on that one. But ideally, um, I don't think there's there's the best way to sanitize a plastic tap um, year after year after year, even if you want to. Okay. Thank you, Stu. Here's a question from Laura. What basic tools do you recommend for a teacher who simply wants to teach kids that sap comes from trees, not likely to collect and boil 30 or 40 gallons? <laughs> <laughs> well, some some of the small setups in, in the photos are perfect. I mean, one one uh what, one of the pro one of the programs at Maplewood Park that I've been a part of. In their demonstration is they've got all these logs that are standing on up on end and the kids come in and they use a brace and a bit and they drill a hole in a tree <laughs> and that program goes on before and after well after the maple season and in the maple after season they're boiling water to show them how sap is boiled in a pan and then um you can use a stock pot over over gas, you can use any of the small setups. It, it, it's all sized based on the amount of sap that that you want to have. Okay. Thank so you. I I don't think you need a, a a big commercial operation to get kids enhanced with the whole process of teaching them that the sap comes from a tree and it turns into syrup. And by golly, when you get through this, we're going to give you some ice cream with syrup on it, and they're going to be hooked. <laughs> Great. And you can certainly email Stu uh, at his uh, email address, uh, uh, capicola at aol.com. Uh, so Lauren, another question? Um, next question. I've heard that if your sap freezes, you can remove the ice to reduce the water mm -hmm. content because the sugar won't freeze. Is that true? I love that question. I was hoping it would come up. <laughs> um, if you get, and, and we have actually tested it. I, I did an experiment for a guy that, uh, that wanted an answer to that question, really in terms of how the Native Americans um, used to concentrate sap. The answer is, where does the sugar go when a whole bucket freezes solid? Hmm. Um, there, is, there is sugar in that ice. What happens is the early, early skim of ice across the top of a bucket or a bin of sap is going to have 
much less sugar in it than the rest of the concentration. There is some sugar in in that top layer, um, and there's no reason to think that if you throw the ice away, you, you are going to end up with slightly more concentrated sap below that. Um, I think in one of my pictures, I, I showed uh, us pumping sap out of, uh, out of our bins, and we just poke the little spout through the ice and suck up the sap. And I personally like leaving the sap in our, the sap, the ice in our bins as basically refrigerant for the sap that's going to come. It keeps it cold. And I am less worried about throwing away water or ice with very low sugar content than I am about keeping my sap cold. So uh, long answer, there is less sugar in the ice that's forming at the top of your containers. Um, but at some point, if you freeze the whole bucket, all your sugar has been frozen. So. Next question, Stu. Uh, what about rain, snow, when using open bucket collections? Um, rain and snow are going to give you a more diluted, lower mm -hmm. sugar content in the sap that's in your bucket. Mm -hmm. um, we like to use our, our sealed containers and run our lines in off the side to minimize that. Um, and I think uh, one of the things I didn't show is, is really filtering the sap before you boil it and getting out any insects, any pieces of bark, any, any uh, material that's come out of your sap hole uh, from, from drilling the hole that's worked its way through to the sap. Uh, collection. So uh, okay. I, you're boiling it away and it's going to be, I'm, I don't see any worry from a health standpoint from snow and rain, but you're, you really want to minimize it if you can. And uh, it's going to, it's going to just give you more liquid to, to have to boil away. But okay. that's why they cover, that's why they cover buckets and seal bags. Exactly. Um, next question, any pests, diseases, or invasive weeds you deal with at your maple tree farm? Uh, there's a bunch I should be dealing with better than I do. Um, yeah, we've, we've got buckthorn that is creeping through some of the areas of our woods. I don't do enough of it, and I should, and I plead guilty. Sue, so here's a comment from uh, Phyllis, just a comment, I think. I make maple, or I make syrup for fun, one box elder. Uh, once it, it it's reduced to what I consider syrup, I store it in the sterile mason jars and keep it refrigerated. It eventually crystallizes, but the tree gives me more sap every year. How about that? And then uh, Tim asked a question, how do you clean the clean, or how do you clean the cloth filters when you're uh, filtering the maple syrup? How do you clean uh, the yeah. Hot water only. Uh, you want to rinse them and and rinse them and rinse them with hot water. The hotter, the better. You don't want to use any sort of soapy material because it's going to be almost impossible to get a soap residue out of the filter. And it's amazing how syrup, especially hot syrup, can pick up an off flavor from, from that sort of source. Um, you want to make sure your filters, especially in the off season, are totally dry before they store, before you store them away so they don't get moldy for the same reason. That moldy smell in a filter will carry on. Uh, they say not, they say to let them drip dry. You're not supposed to twist them or, or coil them up to, to squeeze the water out of them uh, because you'll tear the fibers uh, in the cloth. So basically, hot water several times. Um, we always pull ours inside out and put them in hot water. And actually, we're using the, the some of the condensate off of the evaporator that uh, for rinsing. Um, but you, you just want to use hot water and rinse and drip dry. Um. When evaporating, can you continually add fresh sap 
as it boils down or do you need to do it batch by batch? Well, the, the first three, I, you can add SAP and you should add SAP um, if you've got it. I, I, would, I would be a, a proponent of boiling all the SAP you can in a single batch and just keep adding um, if, you're, if you're on a batch system. Uh, within reason, I say that. Um, but um, we used to take and boil and boil and boil for hours. In fact, on our, I guess I can say this in public, but when we were boiling in the backyard for fun for ourselves, uh, we'd boil all day and we would just keep adding sap um, until we ran out. And then we would boil it down to as low a level in our big flat pan as we could without scorching the pan. And that's when we'd pull the pan off and we would finish it over uh, over propane. But we were basically adding and adding and adding sap. And one of the things that happens is you're probably going to make darker syrup than you might otherwise by boiling the sap that's been in there from the beginning and concentrated down. Um, but that's what a batch system is all about. And um, and obviously in a continuous flow system, you're always adding sap as the as the river of of more concentrated sap flows through the system. Okay. So, so Stu, next question. Could you explain more about what niter is and does? As I, am I pronouncing that right? Night, uh, niter? Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see if I can find my slide. But niter naturally precipitates it's solids of minerals that that precipitate out of maple syrup uh, right when it gets close to to becoming so concentrated and you've concentrated so much water out of the sap that the dissolved minerals that were in there uh there's this isn't scientific terms but there's no room for them because there's not enough liquid and they solidify and fall out and um, see if I can. There it is. Uh, sure, it's calcium and magnesium salts of malic acid, but they're natural. Um, but it's because in the very diluted normal sap, um, environment or, or, or solution, um, they're liquid. And as you take more and more water out of that concentrate, there's no room for these minerals and they solidify. Um, they'll cause havoc when they stick to the bottom of your pan and they will impede uh, evaporation in a, in a pan. And the part of it that, that stays in the syrup that, that you're drawing off, um, that's what it looks like. It, uh, it's okay. gritty, and it's it is not necessarily harmful, but it isn't very palatable. So I don't know if that totally answers the question, but it uh, it's natural, and it happens whenever you get close to syrup at at near boiling temperatures, which is why you want to be bottling at something substantially below boiling at, at 220. Mm -hmm. Those that are left, uh, you know, there's some good chat going on. I'm not going to read all the chats, uh, actually comments, but uh, I'm trying to get all the questions done. But there's some websites there on the chat too that uh, people can look at. Next question is, uh, I think is a good one. Uh, is it best to make syrup with same species of maples or can different species be mixed without much effort are affecting uh, the flavor? Quick answer. I don't see any reason why you can't mix species. Um, we don't because we have virtually all sugar maples, but I I know a lot of producers that if uh, if their lines are are between two sugar maples and between them is a, is a box elder, they'll tap the box elder. What you're going to probably find is that when you mix species, you're probably going to 
well, you're going to average out the sugar content. So if if you're if you're bringing in some low sugar varieties of, of species, uh, you may get more sap, but you may get uh, lower sugar content overall. But but you've got more sap to work with. So I don't I don't have a problem with that. Uh, okay. As long as it's a healthy tree and you're you're drilling into healthy sapwood, you're going to get better sap. Thank you, I got a two question one. Um, what should be the smallest diameter tree safe to tap? And you mentioned birch trees. What will the syrup taste like from a birch tree? <laughs> uh, the recommendations from the research is a tree should not be tapped until it is at least 10 to 12, well, 10 inches minimum. They say 10 to 12 uh, measured chest high. And that's the diameter of the trunk. Um, and, you know, a, a lone tree um, out on a lawn with, with plenty of sunshine and plenty of water, they may reach that in 20 years. Uh, I've got trees in, in my woods that don't have near the, near the ideal uh, canopy opening. And they take a long time. You can get a tree that's 40 years old before they're really tappable. That may be, it, it, it really depends. But um, uh, we've been out east and the guys, some of them have said, if we waited till a tree was 10 inches, we'd never tap a tree because of the condition of the woods and, and, and the way their trees grow and, and their species. But the, the research recommends 10 inches diameter chest high. And birch syrup. I have tasted a couple of samples of birch syrup. Um, and in fact, I think the university's arboretum in, in Chanhassen or where it is, yeah, it's outside of Chanhassen, mm -hmm. um, does birch syrup and they do um, walnut syrup. My impression was that the birch syrup I have tasted, which isn't a lot, is kind of dark and kind of heavy and sort of towards the molasses side in terms of flavor. It's just a deep, rich flavor. And I would cook with it. I'm not sure I would put it on pancakes, the stuff I had tried. On the other hand, the walnut syrup that they had on there was exquisite. It was, <laughs> it was really terrific. The problem with walnut syrup is... Um, it's low sugar and it takes a lot of takes a lot of sap and you're not you're not doing the best thing for the sawwood value of a walnut tree okay thank you sue this uh, Stu, this is a follow-up question of the birch, birch syrup uh, from michael birch syrup is very strong kind of like molasses just like i said uh, <laughs> it, it will run uh it will ruin good maple syrup so obviously you don't want to mix it with oh. your your uh, sugar maples and, and other maple trees. And oh, probably, totally agree with that. I would totally agree with that. And in fact, the, the, what I understand is the birch season usually follows maple season anyway. But yeah, I would not, unless you're just playing around and having fun, I would not really mix the sap from different species like that into a single syrup operation. Okay. Lauren? Um, can syrup be put into mason jars cooler than 180, but then hot water bathe for the final seal to prevent the chance of mold? Well, I think I think a room temperature bottle, and the issue is is the temperature of the syrup going in the jar. The hot syrup will warm up and sterilize a clean jar. You want the jar clean, but um, I don't think it's at all necessary to heat the jar. It can't hurt, but I don't think that's necessary if the syrup itself is in the 180 to 200 degree range. Okay. Uh, Shane Bechea is our extension educator in Blue Earth and Lasur counties, and he mentioned too that uh, uh, he's recommending don't plant Norway maples. Uh, I, I understand that they're on the DN DNR. I think they're listed on the DNR. Uh, possible invasive species list. So um, they do go off the property with their uh, aggressive seeding. So I uh, may want to look for another maple tree uh, to plant if you're looking at planting some. 
Let's see. Now that oh, you mention it, I, I, I have heard that and I agree. And early on on our property, just as a side note here, my soil water conservation district had uh, part, part of part of the recommendation in our woods was was to plant variety that you didn't want monospecies. So if you're going to plant trees, plant something different. And on their list of trees was the Amur maple, which is a little bush that sounded like a fun thing to plant. Well, two years later, it showed up on the on the the invasive list. Yes. Yeah, because it prolifically uh, oversees itself and can go off the property. Yeah, a lot yep. of a lot of praises on the comments uh, sections here. Stu, uh, good job and thanks for a great uh, presentation. Um, well, where do you suggest people go who want to know more? Um, good question. Uh, <laughs> perfect opening. Here it comes. The North American North American Maple Syrup Producers Manual third edition was just released mm -hmm. it has it is science-based it's readable it's written by professionals a lot a lot of them from ohio state and the university of vermont and 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 new york but experts in each of the of the sections in the manual um you can access this for free on the download uh, and download it yourself if you want to get a spiral bound copy they're available for fifty dollars and that includes um shipping and this is the the website to order it it, it was produced by the university of vermont and the north american maple syrup council that is it's a terrific resource and it's everything about maple way more than you can read in a single evening but it's all there and it's it's readable and well organized the other, uh, I got to put in a plug for the Minnesota Maple Syrup Producers Association. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on the board, so this isn't totally unbiased, but it's the best gathering for maple producers that want to talk to each other and exchange ideas and ask and answer the kinds of questions that are coming up today. Um, we have typically have two in-person meetings a year, spring and fall. Um, lots of chance to, as we call it, talking maple and tours. I've a lot of the pictures that were on that I used today came from from tours over the years, and just the chance to see how other people are doing what what I'm doing, but they're doing it differently. Um, that's the best twenty five dollars you can spend. On top of the best fifty dollars to buy the manual, on top of fifty dollars to buy yourself a hydrometer. So I probably cost you folks three hundred dollars today to do it right. Uh, there's there's lots of other sources of information. Um, the manufacturers are doing a great job promoting and explaining their products with videos. Um, I love watching the YouTube videos from amateur hobbyists. But I'd be really careful. A lot of that is not best practices, shall we say. Mm -hmm. um, but they're fun to watch. You can learn, but it's not it's not in keeping necessarily with what you'll find in the in the maple syrup producers manual. Um, I could go on. There's lots. Of, there's lots and lots of good information. Thank you, Stu. There, there's a, a number of people have mentioned uh, in the chat uh, the the Minnesota Maple Association or, uh, Producers Association for Maple Syrup, and then also the we we typed in that other resource. So I'm glad you had two slides on it. Uh, Lauren, you you have another question? Ah, uh, yes. Is finish bricks variable based on the temp of the syrup? Um the bricks of the syrup is the bricks of the syrup but when you use these instruments temperature will influence the reading so on a hydrometer for example most of them will have a red line that says for hot syrup and they'll have another red line for where it should be floating at room temperature and so the answer is yes, in terms of determining what the bricks is, the instrument will vary by temperature. And uh, the folks at Smoky Lake out in Wisconsin have got a hydrometer cup that has got a 
it's a slick little deal. It compensates uh, and will give you a, a temperature reading of the syrup and it will it will relate to the reading on the floating um, hydrometer. So it'll make the adjustment if your temperature isn't um, at 211 hot syrup degrees. Um, so that you do have to compensate, your instruments need to be compensated for temperature. The, uh, the refractometer that I showed you, they have, they have, they will compensate for the temperature of the syrup. If you put a couple drops on of hot syrup on a refractometer, it cools quickly and it, it has to stabilize to get uh, a reading, but that it, in a matter of a few seconds, you can get a good reading on, on hot syrup or warm syrup as it, as it uh, cools down or, or reaches room temperature. But so yes, temperature is a factor, but it's not gonna change the, the density of the syrup as much as it's going to change how you read it. Okay. Um, Stu, I have a question on maple butter. Can you talk about how maple <laughs> butter is made? <laughs> um, no, I shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, we're a, we're a really a simple, basic operation here. We sell maple syrup, and we do our best to sell our best maple syrup. We do not do value-added products. Um, the, the next step, we don't make sugar, we don't make butter, we don't make, I think butter and cream are essentially the same thing. I know that it is, you, you take it beyond the temperature for syrup, and you take out more of the water, and somehow you whip it to give it a texture that's that's buttery or creamy but um, it is one of the subjects that we cover quite frequently and have demonstrations at the MMSPA in-person meetings and uh, uh, I am not the guy to talk to about butter I just told you more than I know <laughs> okay thank you Lauren um, if the sap running is tied to barometric pressure, what's a good way for backyard tappers to know when the sap is running and to start tapping? Well, I, no, I, I, for that purpose, I would continue to rely on the weather forecast for sunny days above freezing and freezing nights. Um, we're, we're we're at least three weeks away from sap running in my area. We were 12 below, 15 below last night, and we got another five or six inches of snow two days ago. So um, barometric pressure, my point was it's it's more complicated than just saying hot sunny days at 40 following a 20 degree night, which that's ideal, but um, it's also, in addition to temperature and sunshine and freezing and thawing, um, the barometric pressure also has an impact. And I, I've just never thought that was discussed enough. Um, there's not a lot you can do about it. You just have to be aware that it is a factor. Um, and that was the point I was trying to make. Okay, thank you, Sue. Uh, it seems like there's some questions on black walnuts. Uh... And any, have you tapped black walnuts before? I think Greg mentions the walnut sugar content is close to maple syrup, but the sap flow is less mm -hmm. and it, is, it has pectin in it. So it's much harder to filter. I can't disagree with any of that because I've never tapped a walnut. Okay. Okay. And then uh, Michael says a birch syrup is about 1% sugar content and sap takes a lot of boiling and, and looks also looks like uh, and tastes quite a bit like molasses, more for, <laughs> more for cooking. So, but maybe I got that one right then. I think you did. A red maple syrup is my opinion, uh, it has more robust maple flavor as compared to sugar maple. I have done both. That's from Paul. So that's just made way more of a comment. Okay, uh, and, and I wouldn't argue with that because I don't have experience with the red maple. Okay, any other questions, Lauren, for your side? Um, these one, these two kind of go side and side. Um, if you have enough sap, but it's still running, can slash should you plug the hole or anything else related to after sapping wound care to consider? And I think it kind of goes with this one. Um, just brushing up on, let's see here. Um, 
the tapping pattern, allowing the tree to grow and form new sapwood by the time you get completely around the tree. Can you brush up on that as well? Okay. Uh, the first question, um, no, you should not put, it's not recommended to put anything into the tap hole once you have pulled your taps. They're going to drip a little and they talk about tap holes drying up, they don't dry up so much as they form, um, <laughs> they form a scab, they form a crud and it dries out eventually. But you're gonna get some seeping uh, out of that wound for a while after, after you pull taps and just let it heal on its own. Um, as for the tapping pattern, um, if you got a big tree and you go around it, in, in a perfect circle um, and you're only doing one tap a year and it's a big tree, you're probably, I don't know, that's not what's recommended. They say to go to a, a spiral and to go up and away from the old tap hole. Um, I have seen trees that, that look like they should be girdled because there's so many holes around the whole circumference at essentially the same level. Um, and that, that just can't be healthy because every one of those tap holes is non-conductive wood, uh, is, is what's forming behind it uh, as the tree heals up. So, um, Okay, I have another question almost regarding the tapping. Uh, so Christina says, can you comment on the signals you use to know when to stop tapping, i.e. what do you, what do the trees do? And I suppose that's if it's over tap. Well, if, if she's talking about when in the season, um, obviously you want to yes. start. She, she you want to yes. start. Ideally, if you knew you would tap all your trees the day before sap's going to run. Mm -hmm. And no one can predict that. Um, I've tapped trees and I thought sap should run. And, and yeah. there's not enough frost on the ground for the trees to draw water. And what should be ideal conditions, you're not getting any sap. Um, so I would say any time early in the season, you can tap a tree and, and you may have missed some sap because you're two weeks late, but you probably have another two weeks ahead of you where you can get, where you can get good sap. Uh, I think the related question is how do you know when the season is over? And as the trees start to form buds, the chemistry of the sap changes and you'll start to produce what they call buddy flavored syrup from end of the season sap. Um, typically the syrup that's coming off of end of the year, end of the season sap is darker um, and, and more likely to have just natural off flavors because of, of the chemistry changing. And you know it's over when the syrup and when the sap in your containers starts to get slimy and milky. Um, the heat and the bacteria that's already in your your system, coupled with the changing chemistry of the sap, you can smell it. You can just tell that the sap is done. And I'm usually so tired by the end of the season, I welcome it. <laughs> but, Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Stu, if you could stop sharing, I'm going to get into some more slides. I'm I'm done with the chat right now. Lauren, uh, you want to finish up on some of your questions, please? And I'll uh, close with a few slides, ending slides for people. Yeah, so I'm um, kind of going I, on. I stop, I stop sharing? Is that what you told me? Yep, yep. If yep. you could stop, stop sharing, there should be a red uh, kind of button there. Yep, there you go. And then I'll start right. sharing mine. Okay, very good. Let me share this one. And I've got a screen. Let's see if it goes up. Um, Lauren, do you see the screen now? Yep, I see it. Great. Do you have some more questions to ask, Stu? Um, there's about six more. Did you want me to ask them now? Uh, <laughs> yeah, if there's a, maybe a couple more. And, and yeah, a couple more. I, I, have, I have plenty of time. I told oh, you guys, okay. you get... Well, I'm doing, go I'm doing this, I'm doing this for free and you get what you pay for. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, get them, go ahead with your six, Lauren. Um, so these two kind of go together. Um, what months does the maple syrup season typically run through in Minnesota? And can you tap in the spring and fall? Good questions. Um, in our area, 
which is west central Minnesota. We're 60 miles southeast of Fargo Moorhead. Um, sometime between the 15th of March and 15th of, 15th of April, our sap is going to run here. We usually run two to three weeks behind the folks south of the Twin Cities. Um, sometimes not quite that much. We're usually we're usually a week to 10 days behind my friends in the St. Cloud area. Um, so long way of saying sometime between the 1st of March and the end of April, most of the syrup in Minnesota is going to be made. But it, it literally moves from south to north. And our friends up on the... Uh, uh, north of Duluth, north of Lake Superior, lots of times they're still making syrup in May, but get it, the season moves from south to north, and it's sometime March, April. That you can count on. Um, then regarding vacuum pumps, what size sizes are used, and how does someone find information on sizing versus length of the, the line? <laughs> Uh, we're talking to the wrong guy here. I have I've seen a lot of vacuum systems. I understand pretty much how they work. I have no experience. Um, if it were me, I would find a producer in your area that's on vacuum and see if they'll let you come visit. Um, the manufacturer, the dealers, they're going to try and sell you stuff, but for sure they are the experts on the equipment and the setups that, that they would recommend. Um, so I'm not, I'm not much help there other than I would find somebody in in your area that's using vacuum that can walk you through it. Um, just I'm not the guy. Um, do you use an RO system to reduce the boiling time? Any comments on the pros and cons of that? <laughs> I was wondering if reverse osmosis would come up. Yes, we have we have a what is it, a 600 gallon per hour single post RO and reverse osmosis is nothing more than forcing sap through a membrane that separates water molecules from sugar molecules. And when we use ours, and I don't use it with every batch in the season, but when we have lots of syrup and lots of sap, I need to concentrate it because we've got a relatively small evaporator. But we'll, uh, we'll take out maybe 60% of the water before we cook it. And um, 50, 60% easily by one pass um, through our RO. There is lots, there was lots of debate as to whether an RO and reducing the actually the cook time of of the concentrate affected syrup, they've done a lot of research out east um, on ROs and how high you can take uh, how high you can concentrate before you boil. And anything the research I've seen says that the anything reasonable in the way of taking higher concentrate into an evaporator as long as it gets a good boil you're going to get good flavored syrup um, it's it's not going to affect the flavor of syrup um, the folks at cdl have come out with something called maple nectar and cdl is an equipment manufacturer and i think they call it nectar but they are taking sap essentially from two or three percent and are owing the sap till it gets to 65, 66, 67% sugar content. And they are not marketing it as syrup, they're marketing it as an alternative sweetener. And what I'm told is it's sweet, but it has no maple flavor or very little. And maple syrup needs to be boiled for the sugars to caramelize and develop flavor. Um, so. Long way of saying, you can carry it to the extreme in an RO and never cook it. Um, if you got a million dollars worth of equipment, I think. But um, RO, an RO, at, there's a lot of them for small producers that are out there, uh, can really make your cooking time more efficient and it shouldn't affect the flavor of your syrup 
in any detectable way, my opinion. Um, then there's only a couple more. Um, any suggestions on how best to clean a small two by four arch evaporator? Example, boiling vinegar, et cetera. Uh, lots of options. Uh, there, there are producers out there who basically leave sap in the pan and let it just ferment and acetize um, and, and not using any additional cleaners whatsoever. Um, the maple syrup equipment suppliers all sell a pan cleaner. Um, that's basically, I think, a, a phosphoric acid kind of um, mixture. Um, I use that at the end of the season on my sap pans. Um, but there is a, a similar product, I think, that uh, the dairy industry uses for cleaning their stainless steel equipment that's available at Fleet Farm. I'm not sure that that's quite as effective as the, the pan cleaner you can get from the maple people. But it really is important to clean the pan. I use a power washer. I use a power washer. I use a power washer and hot water to clean my pans. So those are a couple of alternatives. They talk about that extensively in the Maple Manual. Um, this one goes back to the mason jar question. If your mason jars are full of syrup, cooler than 180, could you bathe them in hot water to achieve, achieve the 180 to 200 degrees syrup? I guess I don't know why not. Um, if it's You, you just have to leave it long enough in a hot water bath to be sure that the contents inside the jar heats up. I don't know what happens to the headspace. Um, if you're, if you're going to put room temperature syrup in a jar and fill it to the top, and then you bring it up to 180 degrees, that syrup's going to expand and want to go somewhere. I'd hate to see you blow up the jar just by overheating it. Um, so I don't know if that makes sense, but I, I would really think you'd want to get the syrup up to the desired temperature before you put it in the jar or very close to it. And then this last one, I'm not sure if we already answered this one, but does silver maple make good maple syrup? What's the sugar content? Uh, not my expertise. Uh, I think the, the, the big wrap on silver maples is, is the comparatively lower sugar content of the sap. Um, but I don't have a lot of experience or knowledge of that. And, but I know a lot of people that, that have silver maples in their yard, and that's what they make their syrup out of. I'm sure if you put a couple of samples side by side, you'd start to detect some differences between species. Thank you, Lauren. And Stu, it's been an excellent day. Uh, thank you so much for your knowledge and your uh, wisdom and your experience in this uh, maple syrup uh, Quest and, and webinar that you had here. Uh, I've just got a few closing slides here. As you can see on your screen, uh, Stu's uh, uh, Camp Aquila Pure Maple Syrup uh, website and also email there for people that want to email questions. Thank you for all your chat. I've got a few slides to close with. Uh, we have a few more sessions. Actually, this is our first uh, Fridays with the Forester, but we have a lot more coming up. So if you've registered for the class, you're registered for all of them. So uh, you'll get a reminder of uh, the Thursday, next Thursday for our Minnesota School Forest. Then we have climate adaptation. Uh, we have windbreaks and living snow fences as we probably needed this year, right? Uh, foraging with the wild edibles, uh, planting a timber sale, uh, keep your woodland uh, healthy and resilient. And then uh, participatory science uh, or community science uh, type uh, uh, work with the uh, invasive species such as spotted lanternfly and others uh, that Anja Gupta will talk about. Uh, so at the end of the, as you leave today, there'll be a, a close, your closing Zoom will be an evaluation piece. Uh, 
about four questions, very easy questions. We'd like you to answer some of those and uh, you're anonymous, certainly, uh, but we're asking questions about what you gained from today's presentation and also uh, some uh, comments about future presentations and webinars that we want to do in the future. So uh, thank you for coming. If you haven't gotten uh, our Minnesota, my Minnesota Woods webinar, or actually it's a, a news release that goes out every month. Uh, you can access that by just the Z link and there's an email there. Uh, if you want to look at more, there's a, a, a Z link uh, to the Minnesota Woods and the email. And all, all these recordings are recorded on our uh, Z-Link Fridays, so z.umn.edu slash Fridays, and we'll get this up probably in a week or so uh, at that uh, location. So thank you again for attending today's webinar, and thank you, Stu uh, and, and Lauren, for helping out, and uh, Stu for giving the presentation, wonderful presentation today. Lots of people, we had 84 attendees today, and uh, lots of chat and questions today. Thank you again for coming.